Uh, good morning, everyone. Great to see so many people here this morning. Welcome. Anyway, so that, uh, that song, that uh, psalm that we sang, well, we didn't sing, but it was projected. And it'd be nice to sing. I love those kind of psalms. They move me very deeply <clears throat> if you uh, sing along with them, because all the psalms are like prayers. <clears throat> And they, um, you know, they explore all kinds of different things that uh, the human beings go through. <clears throat> and uh, the songs are attributed to David, King David. And you think you know, people are still singing these songs 3,000 years later. So you think, wow, that's quite a very high political and spiritual culture they had at that time. They had a king sitting on the throne who wrote the, these kind of songs that people are still finding inspiration 3,000 years later. <clears throat> and even though, you know, our last queen was an extraordinary person herself. But again, if you look at most kings in human history, they haven't really been like that. <clears throat> How are we doing? Oh, yeah, there we are. Okay, so do you just want to click? <laughs> so that's some, I mean, <clears throat> Yeah, anyway, we look at the world in which we're living in today. You can see it's not a very peaceful world. This is uh, wars going on in Ukraine. This is um, <clears throat> the results of flood in um, in Libya just recently, and uh, this is the earthquake in uh, in uh, Morocco, and just an earlier one <clears throat> a couple of years ago in Turkey. And so if you have a look at this psalm, and it, you know, sometimes you think, well, what's going on today? This is a sign of the last days. It's never been like this. But actually, the whole of human history, these sorts of things have been going on. <clears throat> so this is a psalm written by, uh, attributed to David, <clears throat> and uh, he's regarded as a prophet, not only within uh, Judaism and Christianity, but also within Islam. <clears throat> so this is one... Uh, and so, I don't know if you know, but Muslims often regard the Torah received by Moses as written down in the, in, in the Old Testament as being corrupted in some way. They also regard what they call the Gospel, Injil, given to Jesus and written down in the New Testament as also being corrupted in some way. But they also recognize that the, <coughs> the Psalms given to David, they're somehow not corrupted. So it's interesting, it's a sort of common text uh, for Jews, Christians, and Muslims that is not uh, controversial in that sense. But anyway, <coughs> it's uh, of the sons of Korah. Does anybody know who, remember who Korah was? No? Okay, do you remember what happened uh, when after <coughs> they'd been traveling in the, in the wilderness, they got to Canaan, and the... Uh, didn't work out with the 12 spies that went over. Do you remember what happened after that? Before they started their 40 days, 40 years wandering in the wilderness? Anybody? There was a rebellion. <coughs> and um, there were certain people, <coughs> uh, elders, mostly from within Moses' actual family, extended family who rebelled and said, we want to get rid of you, Moses. We want to have a new leader, a new captain who will take us back to, um, to Egypt where we had melons and watermelons and all sorts of delicious things and cucumbers. <clears throat> and they also objected to the fact that they said Moses was, uh, <clears throat> thought he was the boss and that Aaron, who was his brother, didn't like the fact that Aaron's brother was the priest, chief priest. And the leader of this group was someone called Korah. So he was, I think he was uh, maybe a cousin of Joseph, sorry, a cousin of Moses. Anyway, he led this rebellion. And then God, then Moses, you know, when there's a big conflict, <clears throat> and Moses asked God to swallow them all up into the earth. And apparently the earth opened up and swallowed them all up, and they died. <clears throat> Well, the people still weren't satisfied because you can't win arguments just through the use of physical force or violence. And so there was another process afterwards that people came to recognize that Moses was the person who was actually very humble and appointed by God and could lead. But uh, Moses, anyway, lots of things went on. But anyway, what is interesting then <coughs> is that the Korah, he was one of the people who composed many psalms and his sons did as well. 
So apparently his sons were also swallowed up, but they managed to survive. And I always thought this was interesting. Even though Korah had led the, the biggest challenge to Moses' leadership and tried to replace Moses, basically trying to stage a coup d'etat, still his name is remembered in the Bible. Still these psalms were attributed to him and to his family. It's not like some cultures where one person is accused of being a traitor and they go and you kill this person's children and grandchildren and uncles and aunts. You just wipe out the whole family. Yeah? That's the way it is somewhere. That's the way it is in North Korea. Yeah? Whereas in the Bible, it was interesting. There was this person who led this revolt, but people still acknowledged the quality of the Psalms that he wrote. And they were still attributed to him and to his sons, who also were singing and writing, writing Psalms. And it's very different to the kind of cancel culture you have today. Somebody makes a small mistake and you just try and cancel them and get, get rid of their books and this, this, and this, and this, and this, and wipe out their name. Whereas here, okay, he made a mistake. But even if he made a mistake, you still can recognize all the good things that this person did. Just because this person made one mistake, it doesn't mean that his whole life had no value. Yeah? I think that's a really important lesson there. <clears throat> the fact that, you know, whereas in our own culture is deviating very, very much from this Jewish, Judeo, Christian kind of tradition of people being able to make a mistake and you apologize, you repent, you're forgiven, and you can have a new start. In the cancel culture of today, there are new starts. There is no opportunity for repentance, forgiveness, and okay, a new start, a new beginning. Instead, people just get cancelled. Yeah. Okay, so I thought that was interesting. Anyway, let's go through it. <clears throat> God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the sea, into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. So this is a very poetical way, basically of describing floods, very poetical way of describing earthquakes, tsunamis, all these kind of natural disasters and catastrophes that take place. And of course, there are other ones as well. There was a pandemic which we, which we went through recently. And all these things cause people to be very anxious. We get very anxious when we look at the television, we see these wars taking place and terrible things. We, we're very anxious when we see, you know, sort of things that go on in, in Morocco, the incredible uh, results of the earthquake, the floods, <clears throat> and then people get very anxious about climate change, very anxious about this, very anxious about Brexit, very anxious about all sorts of things. So this is just, this is just the human condition. We see all these things, it's very easy to become anxious. It's very easy to worry about all these things. It's very easy to become very stressed out by all these things. <clears throat> and when one does, of course, it affects one's health. And of course, health in itself is, can lead to an anxiety. You know, when you, when you become really ill, <clears throat> or someone in your family becomes very ill, it's, you know, it's just very natural to worry and to become very anxious. But that, you know, these are just natural responses and reactions to these kind of things. So what was going on today is exactly the same sort of things that were going on 3,000 years ago. <clears throat> there is a river whose streams make the city of God. So this is like a different thing, different tone. This is Jerusalem. There's a stream, a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. So he had this vision that God dwelt in the temple and that people shouldn't uh, become anxious. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her, her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. <clears throat> so here's this idea that people should, shouldn't worry because there is Jerusalem, which is the place where God dwells and God dwells in the temple. And so you think, well, okay, that's what was written 3,000 years ago. <clears throat> but of course, the temple itself was destroyed <clears throat> by the Babylonians and then destroyed a second time by the Romans. And you think, okay, well, what's going on here? How does one explain this? How does one deal with this? This promise that God made 
that Jerusalem would never fall, the temple would never fall, that's a place <coughs> where it's going to dwell forever. <coughs> but the thing is, does God actually dwell within a physical building? Yeah. Is it possible, uh, as, as Solomon said when he was opening the temple, consecrating the temple, <coughs> Then he said, how is it possible, <coughs> you, <coughs> speaking to God, who created the universe, who created the sun and the stars and all the planets, how is it possible for you to live and dwell in this little house that I've built for you? And that's not the point. It's not that God literally dwells there, but it's in the act of building this kind of place <coughs> that invites God to be present among the people. <coughs> But anyway, the reality is these sort of things come and go. And then you think, okay, well, the temple's been destroyed. Maybe God doesn't really exist. So people have to deal with all these kind of, you know, these kind of incredible trauma and incredible shocks which come about to them as individuals, as families, but also as a spiritual community. And as Robin was saying, you know, you can imagine the Japanese church, <coughs> church in Japan is probably also going through an incredibly anxious time at this moment, wondering, you know, we've done this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this for the last 40, 50, 60 years. Why is this sort of calamity disaster befalling us? And then, okay, but as it says here in the Psalms, this is just the way life is. Life has always been like this, and life will always be like this. There will always be calamities. There will always be trauma. There will always be these situations. It's not because even if the fall hadn't have taken place, there will still be volcanoes. There will still be earthquakes and tsunamis and all these natural phenomena which cause so much suffering and lead to so much suffering would still happen even if there'd be no fall. It's just because the earth is alive. Yeah, the earth has got a very hot molten core and everything's moving and the result of that is mountains appear you know, oceans appear, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's just these are just natural processes, nothing to do with the fall of man. And so, well, how should we be then? How should we be when these things happen to us or befall us? And you can imagine you see these things, it's just horrendous. You know, if you're living your life and suddenly a war starts and suddenly you become a refugee and suddenly you have to leave your home, which you may have lived in for, and <clears throat> your family may have lived in for generations, and suddenly uprooted to become a refugee. Maybe, you know, half or even all your family are killed. What do you do? Yeah. How, do you, how do you face life into the future? It's very, you know... And of course, in the, in the 20th century, you had the... Uh, there's a Holocaust, you know, you, you can read and listen to many testimonies of uh, Jews who, you know, lost 30, 40 relatives and they were the only survivor within the whole extended family. What do you do when that happens to you? How do you cope with this? How do you respond to this? You become anxious and worried. How do you deal with these kind of traumas and difficulties of health and all sorts of things? <clears throat> so this is... Uh, <clears throat> this is, um, you know, the, the, I mean, Cora himself and his sons, they also went through a you know, pretty traumatic experience, you know, as a result of rebelling against Moses. <clears throat> anyway, the response, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So having this confidence, that's what faith is. Even though all these things are taking place, still I believe and I know that God is with us. And one of the most moving things is, you know, I've often found that, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it just so happens some of my own, you know, cousins perished in the Holocaust, so I've taken a particular interest in this. But, you know, what do you do when you're there, knowing you're just going to be entering a, a gas chamber and you're going to be murdered? What do you do? What do you do? And there were lots of stories about people who went into the gas chamber saying, well, even if God is going to do this to us, we're not going to stop believing in God. It's like God is testing us and we're going to not give in to this. And they would go into the gas chamber singing psalms, which would be reflecting the reality which they're experiencing in their own life. This kind of confidence that, you know, despite all the things that are happening, still God exists, God is a reality, God is with us. And of course, God is suffering more than any, you know, 
with us. <clears throat> the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolation he's brought on the earth. <clears throat> he makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. You get very much the vision we find in Isaiah. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now here's the idea. Okay, all these things are taking place. All these wars are happening. These natural calamities and disasters are happening. All kinds of things are happening within our own family, our own community, our health. But still, we shouldn't be anxious about these things. We should just be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And this is the thing, you know, life is here in this world, but there's also life into the next world as well. So, you know, there's no point in getting anxious about these things because getting anxious doesn't actually change anything. Getting worrying about things doesn't change things. The only thing that gets changed by worrying is oneself and not in a good way. The more anxious you become, doesn't affect anybody else, well, except the relationship you have with them. It affects oneself. <clears throat> but actually, instead, we should be still. Take time out just to, to meditate, to pray, to be still. And, you know, sometimes it's necessary. There's all kinds of stuff going on. You know, people, listen, you know, people talking and this, this and this. It's very easy to become affected by all these things and to react in a particular way. But it's important then just to find a place within ourselves of stillness where all this stuff is going on. It's something which I learned a lot when I was fundraising. You, know, you go into one pub or after another, after another, and all kinds of situations you'd see. And it's very easy to become affected by all these things. But if you actually have this put a point of stillness within oneself, feeling the very much the presence of God, then despite all the stuff that's going on around one, one can still be at peace. And one can radiate peace. And then actually what happens is the world around us <clears throat> starts to change because of us, because we have that sense of peace within ourselves. <clears throat> Isn't that what you were singing about, something like this, were you, Peter? I can't remember now. Like <laughs> yes. Anyway, I thought it fitted very nicely, the songs that you chose there. And, um, yeah, this is, um, you know, as I said, this is just a common experience of what it is to be a human being. One goes through all these kind of challenges, and one always will do, you know, maybe financial, business, or this or that, education, or what's going on at school, or wherever we happen to be in our work. And I uh, think, okay, well, this is the way it's always been. It's the way it's always going to be like this. So I need to be at peace. I need to realize these are some things which I can change, and some things which I can't change. So what's the point in worrying and becoming anxious about the things that I can't change? It should just be, okay, this is just the way that it is, let it be. And I'll let God sort this out. And, you know, and then instead of worrying about it, you just say, okay, I'll put all these things into the hands of God. And then find this deeper stillness and presence within my life. And then you start to find God working through you to start to solve these kind of problems that before you may have been very anxious or very stressed out about. Yeah. So today is a bit of a short message, uh, but it's just something that came to me during the week, uh, you know, for my situation, family, community, all the sorts of things that are going on. I myself am very interested in politics. It's very easy to get to work up about all the sort of things that go on. But the reality is, whether a vote goes one way or the other, you can't change it. There's no point in getting worked up about it or emotional about it. These are just things that happen. And one just needs to, okay, this is what's happened. Let's go forward from here. And I think this is always a good point, you know, not to become anxious and stressed out. Do you know somebody who got very anxious and stressed out in the Bible? Was Lot's wife. What happened to her? turned into a pillar of salt. Okay, so she, so, you know, the angels came along and said to Lot and his family, it's going to, anyway, I'm not going to go to the whole story, it's going to be a disaster, you need to leave the city. And Lot and his wife, they had three daughters, four daughters, and two of them were unmarried, and two of them were married. 
And the two unmarried ones, they went together with Lot and his wife and they left the city and they went into the mountains. But the two, one, two that were married, they tried to persuade their husbands to follow them, to leave everything and just go into the mountains with uh, Lot and his uh, family. But they didn't in the end. And so Lot's wife was anxious about, where are my daughters? Where are the other two? Whereas the angel said to Lot and his wife, <clears throat> do not look back. Do not look back. But Lot's wife is very anxious, very concerned. She's worrying. And so she looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. So that's not something literal, but it's more metaphorical. It's somebody who became very anxious and just living in the past, thinking, oh, I wish, it, you know, this, I'd done that differently. I wish this, I wish this. And full of regret about the past. And if you're just full of regrets about the past, and anxious about the, the past, which, can you change the past? No, you can't change it. You can change the way you look at the past, yes, but you can't actually change what happened, just change the way you look at it. But Lot's, and if Lot's wife, you know, became very anxious, she turned around, and her life then became full of regret and very bitter about what had happened, and very bitter. And because she became very bitter, it means she could no longer move forward into the future. Yeah. One of the things I like doing is reading the obituaries in the Times newspaper or the Telegraph as well sometimes. Particularly in the Times, and they often have obituaries about people who have died, obviously. And it's a bit embarrassing if somebody writes the obituary before you die, but, uh, which is what happened to Alfred Nobel. Um, but anyway, that was good for him. But anyway, and just seeing how people who have accomplished a huge amount in life where they came from and what kind of difficulties they went through as a child. And it's astonishing often, you realize, wow, this person came from this kind of situation. Often, you know, people came here during the late 30s on the kinder transport, you know, left everything behind as children, but they actually went on to accomplish extraordinary things. And it's amazing. And you realize, well, why is that? That's because they didn't look back. They didn't spend all their time angry and resentful and bitter about all the terrible things that had happened to them in the past, and the way they'd been treated and their family been treated. <clears throat> but they looked forward into the future. They didn't look back. And it's such an important lesson, uh, which comes from here, just offering the, all these things into to, to God's hands, let God look after these things, and then just think, well, this is where I am today. This is my reality today. What am I going to do today? and tomorrow and the day after, as opposed to trying to think, well, if I'd done this in the past, it would have all been different today. Okay, maybe it's true, but you can't undo the past. <clears throat> all you can do is think, okay, this is where I am today. <clears throat> How am I going to deal with my current situation, my current troubles, and go forward into the future? Okay, so um, I'd like to stop there. And uh, hand you back over to Raymond. Thank you. <coughs> oh, no, Chris. Sorry? Oh, would I say a prayer? Yeah. Most beloved Heavenly Parent, we thank you so much for being able to spend this time together, reading this kind of psalm, looking at the kind of world in which people lived in 3,000 years ago, which is not very different to the world in which we live in today and all the trials and tribulations that people have always gone through throughout human history. And of course, we ourselves go through our own trials and tribulations. But Father, we want to put our trust in you, and we want to allow you to have sovereignty over our lives and over the world in which we live, and for us to be able to work together with you and for you to be able to work through us. We know, Heavenly Parent, how much you want to work together with your children you never wanted to try to impose yourself upon us, but you always want us to voluntarily cooperate with you, to turn our hearts towards you, even though sometimes, many times, we turn away from you, we forget you, we don't bring you and invite you into everything in our lives. And Father, you don't impose yourself upon us, and you always leave, want to join together with us when we invite you into our lives. We pray, mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, that through the life that we live, we can understand your heart much more deeply, 
We can understand the hearts of people all around us more deeply. So we can be a source of love and compassion to them, to support them, to help them as they go through their difficulties in their life. Heavenly Parent, we pray for all those who suffer because of these terrible calamities that take place, the incredible trauma they must be going through, whether it's earthquake or floods or wars or <coughs> pandemics. Heavenly Father, we pray that we can <coughs> not become anxious or worried about these things, because we know that everything is in your hands. Offer this prayer. Now, my name is William Haynes, the Centre of Blessed Family. I urge you. So a little postscript. <laughs> I forgot to mention about... So it's very easy then for people to become anxious. And so especially children become anxious about these things. One of the things that bothers me is what goes on in schools today. Children are getting frightened by their teachers telling them about Extinction Rebellion, the environment's going to come to collapse, human race is going to maybe become extinct. And, uh, and then, of course, there was this whole thing about the pandemic and people become scared and frightened and anxious. And you could see that the fear that people had, which was not necessary, you know, that they were being frightened by uh, people in authority, the government, and by other people who became panic-stricken. And that's not the right way to respond to these kind of situations, to become panic-stricken. Because when people in authority panic, and of course, everybody else panics and becomes frightened and scared as well. And that was one of the biggest failures, I would say, of the establishment, was the fact they didn't think it through. They panicked and went into lockdown from one day to the next. They panicked. And of course, everybody else was scared. It's a big mistake. You know, if you have a, a position of leadership, it's really important to remain calm and to analyze everything and to come up with a sensible, intelligent policy to respond to these kind of things. And to be honest, it wasn't like that. And, uh, you know, a lot of children, then they get, they get very frightened. And, uh, you know, they get told that the <coughs> everybody's been <coughs> frightened to think about their carbon footprint. Children have been told, you know, if you have, if you have children yourself, you're going to, they're going to use up, they're going to make, produce carbon and things. And so, so many people then are not having children, but not only because of financial constraints, but because they think, well, it's going to affect the environment, you know, in a, in a bad way. And that's completely contrary to what God teaches and the reality of the situation, the world in which we live. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, William. <clears throat> so let's spend a little time in reflection.